Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 417 that's 417 of the Agostino Zynga show how you doing how you feeling great amazing good to hear how am i same old same old well not same old same old cuz it's a new year so happy 2020 wherever you're listening and watching to this happy 2020 hope um, the new year has brought you knows of goodness and positivity and um a chance to maybe i don't know what start a new start a fresh wherever you might be if it's your first time check out the show make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe turn on your notification bell and of course leave me a comment down below that would be more than appreciated and of course support via patreon is always more than welcome you can subscribe to my patreon at patreon.com for slash a g o s t i n h o patreon.com for slash a g o s t i n h o to get one bonus episode of the agostino zinga show for patrons only via the patreon one per month so make sure you go on there and check it out um I'll talk about other topics I don't really speak about. about here get a bit personal you know speaking some more controversial topics that you may have not heard me speak about on here so if you want to listen to those kind of things make sure you jump over to the patreon that's patreon.com for just agostino patreon.com for just a g o s t i n h o there'll be a link down below in the description or in the pin comment make sure you click on that and get involved only one dollar one pound you know for you to sign on there send some shekels you, you're my way to the boy help the kid out so we can continue drinking um what Morrison branded tea and you know shitty flakes of uh, caster sugar in our tea but we digress but we digress so here we are man um 2021 right yeah uh, la, 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 la. what else what are we looking forward to this year what are we looking forward to i guess in some respects we're looking forward to the end of this lockdown right that's what we're looking forward to i guess we've got that kind of coming up on the horizon there's you know some conflicting reports as to when we're going to get back to some level of normality i'm still on the fence as to this whole like idea we're going to save our summer this year my my prediction from the very beginning has always been whatever you did in 2019 you're probably going to be able to start doing in 2022 that's always been my assumption again don't kill them don't shoot the messenger don't get angry at me don't leave me hate comments but i've never really fought this whole idea behind and that's going out again in the summer and getting back to normal that's not going to happen now of course the vaccine is going to help things uh speed things up a little bit uh but i'm still not sold on the government's ability especially in the uk to um to somehow be able to do that at, at a level that would get us to enjoy our life in the summer i just don't see it happening i just don't see somebody that's been able to you know i don't see a government that's been handling this whole pandemic so disastrously from the beginning to the end or from the beginning until now to somehow figure it all out with the vaccines in hand and work out a solution or an option or a strategy that would enable us to get back to normality by the summer because summer is not long right it's not it's not long away i know it, it kind of feels like it but for the most part the year goes by pretty quick it's not going to go by quickly because you're going to be at home especially if you're furloughed you got nothing to do but summer's going to come around pretty quickly right it's going to be you know by, by by the time you blink and wake up it's going to be the end of february then it's going to be heading into march april so do you really think you're going to be able to go to lanzarote by june july i don't know man if i was you i'd probably start thinking about you know traveling inland and you know booking a little airbnb somewhere to come you know to kind of have a bit of a break from your regular scheduled programming but the idea that you're going to be able to go um to barcelona for a festival or something i'm going to say 2022 now the only thing that i can argue with myself about is that obviously I've mentioned before in a previous podcast at Barcelona I think Primavera actually they ran a little um test right they did a little test run where they kind of allowed people to attend the festival um get a rapid test prior and then obviously they got results a couple of hours later and if you were negative you were allowed to come in if positive of course you have to kind of run your ass back home so I could see a l- I could see maybe I can see maybe some EU nations, you know, especially with the dwindling tourism's um tourism industry uh, throughout the entire summer deciding maybe to take this approach in order to kind of allow some money to come into the economy from tourists during the summer, but there's still the obvious the there's still the obvious hurdle of, you know, 
people actually having the appetite to go out and do such a thing in the first place right go and stand shoulder to shoulder with strangers and all that malarkey but who knows maybe it might change but again like i said my prediction has always been from the very beginning um 2022 is probably going to be the earliest you're going to be able to do exactly what he did in 2019 but i'd love to know your predictions let me know your prediction down below when do you think we're going to get back to some level of normality this probably appeals more applies more to the uk people watching the podcast as opposed to probably yeah maybe uk and us if you live in the uk and us let me know what's your earliest prediction as to when you're going to get back to normality i know parts of the us are you know they don't really care about covid and they're sort of like pretending it doesn't exist right texas florida miami um well it's not michigan but there's a few other places where they're just kind of carrying on as normal but what do you think in terms of your overall neighbors your Amer- your fellow american citizens your fellow uk citizens when do you think you're going to go back to normal i'm saying early 2022 so of course you know same time next year we're probably going to go back to normal but let me know your thoughts down below talking about covid and talking about um <laughs> next steps we've got uh we've, it's just been announced a few hours early, a few hours ago uh Boris Johnson announced that we're going to be in our third national lockdown here in the UK to address um, the COVID-19 spike that we've had in the last, what, four months? No, I mean, a month and a half or something, right? Um, Obviously, you guys are aware there's this new variant that's sort of like sweeping the nation. Um, It somehow managed to start in the southeast of England, and now it's kind of slowly but surely creeping its way up across um, the whole of the UK. So they're, you know, they're kind of saying telling us that most likely we're going to have a big issue in the Midlands um, sometime towards the end of February. So they're sort of trying to mitigate that and trying to, you know, um, stop that before it happens and to some degree by enacting a national lockdown, which is interesting because something tells me if it was the other way around, if this mutation started in the north, they wouldn't have they probably would have still had us in tier two, tier three in London. So it's funny that the moment the mutation starts taking a hold of the lot of London in the southeast of England, where most of the power base or the preferred um, citizens live for the government, they quickly make a change. But if it happened up north, it probably would have happened. But regardless, um, this is uh, Boris Johnson essentially laying out what's happening and what we're basically in. Uh, what we basically have to look forward to in the next couple of weeks or so. So let's have a listen to what he has to say. Do, 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 do. Come on, come on, brother. With most of the country already under extreme measures, it's clear that we need to do more together to bring this new variant under control while our vaccines are rolled out. In England, We must therefore go into a national lockdown, which is tough enough to contain this variant. That means the government is once again instructing you to stay at home. Yippee. You may only leave home for limited reasons permitted in law, such as to shop for essentials, to work if you absolutely cannot work from home, to exercise, to seek medical assistance, such as getting a COVID test, or to escape domestic abuse. The full details of what you can and can't do will be available at gov.uk forward slash coronavirus. If you are clinically extremely vulnerable, we're advising you to begin shielding again, and you will shortly receive a letter about what this means for you. And because we now have to do everything we possibly can to stop the spread of the disease, primary schools, secondary schools and colleges across England must move to remote provision from tomorrow, except for vulnerable children and the children of key workers. Everyone will still be able to access earlier settings such as nurseries. We recognise that this will mean it's not possible or fair for all exams to go ahead this summer as normal. The Education Secretary will work with Ofqual to put in place alternative arrangements. We will provide extra support to ensure that pupils entitled to free school meals will continue to receive them while schools are closed, and we will distribute more devices to support remote education. It's funny about the whole um, school meals thing. Do you remember when that was an issue in the beginning of the lockdown, right? Oh, seems when he was like really, really against uh, um, allowing kids to eat. <laughs> oh, I don't know what to say, but well, look, 
we are where we are, right? Um, we know the government's been dealing with it pretty poorly. The issues for me with this whole thing is, you know, I'm not really sold on lockdowns. I don't really know how effective they actually are in terms of stopping a virus or stemming the flow of the sp or stemming the spread of a virus, especially at this stage. I think lockdowns are probably more most beneficial at the beginning of a pandemic, right? When you're sort of trying to get a grip of everything and doing the actual, you know, kind of um, when you're trying your best to um what's that word called limit the amount of admissions into hospitals right so they don't overflow them that's probably when it works the best and then the, in the background you obviously are developing practices and in, in hospitals and stuff and procedures that are going to allow people to recover better when they do get um if they do inevitably do get infected with this virus but in the long term you just can't do lockdowns forever right because of you know especially in a western country and um, with a somewhat democracy right with this idea that you you know have the right to go and move and move around as you please and earn a living and all this sort of malarkey it's just difficult to convince your populace to um stay at home listen to what you say forego their sort of like liberties and whatever it may be um for to help stem the flow of a virus that they feel like the government haven't got any control over that's another part of the issue too right it's all well and good asking people to stay at home but when you keep asking them to stay at home and there's no change and people don't feel as if anything has really moved or changed moved and not, nothing's really happened differently since what the summer it feels like all right or since the end of the summer if anything things have just gone worse and worse right cases keep going up hospitality well cases keep going up hospitalization keeps going up in some places right some officers are reporting they've got not got enough beds some places are saying they're completely empty like it's just so many you know conflicting stories and opinions that exist out there but ultimately what we have is um we don't really have an end goal in mind there's no real end date there's no real idea on what sort of numbers we're sort of aiming for our number cases deaths whatever there's nothing we're sort of aiming for at the moment it's a bit macabre i just say deaths and just move on in it that's just the, the mind of covid we're in at the moment we've not even you know we've not even put a face and name a family a picture to the people that we've missed and we sorry the people that have passed away unfortunately during covid and that's one of the sad realities that we're sort of having to grapple with right everyone kind of want to get back to normal but essentially we are saying when you're saying you want to get back to normal is that you don't care about people that are sick out there you just want to get your life back to normal um it's just really distressing to kind of figure out and wrangle on your head but i guess it is what it is but regardless we don't have any end date and goal we don't have an end goal we don't have a target number of cases or deaths or whatever it may be um and we're just sort of like hoping that this sort of works out. And I think I've said it from ages ago to a few people that I always got the impression that they were really banking on the development of a vaccine to basically get us out of this shit. I don't think they ever had any plan in place to have us to like, um, what was that thing they're doing in Australia and New Zealand? Um, uh, something, I think it's like a term, it's something like zero cases or zero something, right? There was never a plan in place to copy or to emulate or to maybe try our best to get to a level where we could brag about the level, the, the, where we could get to a level where we could brag about how low our case numbers were and how low our death numbers were. I don't think we ever had that in mind because we've never really spoken about that, right? I think we heard a lot of people talking about, you know, Matt Hancock talking about the amount of people that are doing track and trace, the amount of people that are getting tested, but there was never any sort of like pride and kind of um, goal in mind to us to get down to a certain amount of cases so that we could prevent um, the untimely passing of people due to COVID. It never really felt that way. So I always got the impression that they were just hoping and praying that of course, with our, you know, with the level of medical professionals that we have here in the UK, it was bound to happen that we were going to be one of the first countries in the EU or in the world to develop a vaccine that we could kind of roll out pretty quickly. And we did, right? We've done it with two so far, especially the, the most recent vaccines. I think it costs like three pound a pop or something, right? Or per dose. So it's pretty um, cheap to develop and of course it doesn't require you to use a special fridge so all well and good but I thought that that was always a plan it kind of felt like that and I think I think I would have been okay or the world or maybe the country would have been okay if they would just been honest and just said that it kind of renders all the lockdowns prior a bit useless right if we were just waiting for a vaccine anyway we probably would have been better off telling the population hey we're gonna um have some restrictions in place some things will just not be open because we don't want people to hang around i don't know whether it's bars or restaurants doesn't really matter uh pick your poison 
but we're going to allow you to kind of go about your everyday lives, right? With some restrictions in terms of where you can go, what time you can go, bloody blah, 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 how many groups of people, social distance and stuff, but just carry on as normal because we've got, we're developing a vaccine and we're kind of heading towards the finishing line with that. That would have made much more sense. And maybe even it, towards Christmas, if you thought, hey, because it's a flu season in the winter, we want to kind of stem the amount of people that are outside hanging around. You maybe just kind of enact like a short circuit breaker, right? Before the new, before the end of the year, something right just something innovative because i just have a feeling again maybe it's just me that i just don't think lockdowns work for countries like ours or maybe i don't know maybe it's not just countries like us being arrogant but just in general at this stage of the game it's just too late it really is it doesn't do anything um so let's so if anything this lockdown is essentially what they would have hoped it would have been the one before christmas right or the one in the new year the one just before um winter time that would have been the kind of lockdown they were hoping to do then because they would have had a vaccine then we would lock people down which essentially means it allows them to maybe ramp up the amount of vaccination they can do week in week out which is still a num mad number supposedly from stuff i've read online that we have to get two million people vaccinated per week to hit any sort of target to get you know of kind of clearing um the most vulnerable and making sure they're okay and that still requires 90 percent of the population to be compliant so it's like oof like and then you have to set up of course the procedures and the places where they can get that done um there's obviously people in the night in the hospitality industry that are willing to lend their services but there's been a bit of a conflict of interest when it comes to health and safety and all this sort of stuff it's just it's an absolute shit show but hey you know who knows this might work this might legitimately work and not through any fault and not through any kind of um consequence of what the government's doing just because the vaccine's around this might just work because of that because i've got a feeling people might just be fed up and be like you know what i'm just gonna go out and get vaccinated regardless of what the government says i, I should and shouldn't do and when i should go and get it done they're just gonna go get it done for you know for the sake of it just so they can they can kind of get back to some level of normality and then of course with everything shut especially in the uk it's going to limit the amount of people you know coming into contact with each other which would you would hope on paper would limit the amount of spread of covid and then guess what we're back to normal that's the plan anyway that's the hope that's the plan that's the hope in place at the moment but again let me know your opinions down below what do you think do you think um this lockdown 3.0 is going to work or is this just another pointless exercise um from a government that seems to be um hell-bent on proving how inept and clueless they are dealing with this pandemic in any kind of sensible way let me know your feelings and thoughts down below um what happened yeah christmas happened right so you know i don't really care about christmas but i got myself i got myself a couple of gifts or you know um sneakers footwear that i thought i'd want to show you guys stuff that i've kind of bought for myself um first things first i've got a pair of um rick owens Ramones, the bump, the bumper sole ones, right? You see those there. So they're essentially like a um, a rig version of a Converse, right? They've obviously a bit more, a, a little bit chunkier. They've got obviously the bumper sole, which is just an extra sole put on the bottom of a Ramon, which I much prefer. I'm not really a fan of the regular sole on a Ramon or a Geo basket. I think they look a bit odd. Uh, I would much prefer actually getting a thicker sole or just changing the sole altogether. So of course, Doc showed a, a Rick Owens, which is sort of their, what would you call? their sort of um cheaper quote-unquote line that they put out again huge fan of rick love what he kind of does love the aesthetic behind it and really goes easily with a lot of stuff that i wear so that was one then of course i've got a long time pair that i've kind of wanted to buy for ages a pair of saint laurent wyatt's as you can see there, do, 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 do. can you see that? Hopefully you can see that, right? Can you see that? Yes, you can. Hopefully you can, right? A pair of St. Laurent Whites and Black um, Classic um, Heidi Simon model shape, which I'm fairly sure he invented when he was at St. Laurent Paris. And this is, I think I'm going to say debuted, let me guess here and say debuted for winter 2015 or 14. One of my favorite collections, I think it probably is. Um, the collection also kind of featured those uh, jeans with the leather patches on the knees with the zips, um, the leather jackets, the mohair jumpers, 
uh, the jeans with the metal sort of little, you know, chain links and all the little slits, like loads of stuff that have essentially, uh, I think I'm going to say this is a mad comment to say, but I think even Jerry Lorenzo's Fear of God might have been built on that collection entirely. If Hadi Saman didn't exist and he wasn't that slightly normal, I don't think we'd even get um, Jerry Lorenzo, right? So he sort of built his collection off of that. He, he, him less so because I think Jerry Lorenzo deserves a lot of credit for sort of evolving his sort of silhouette. Um, and his shapes and his colors um, away from that. Um, you look at someone like Mike and Mary, right? Would Mike and Mary exist without Haiti Semen at St. Laurent? So this really represents a lot of that era. So I've got those. And then I guess the final pair, which I'm not really that sold on at the moment, right? Are these. These are uh, Converse One Star Highs um, Denim Tears collaborations. Now, obviously, I'm a big fan of David Hammonds, right? Got his books that I purchased, you know, prior to learning about this collab. But of course, the collab sort of inspired by the work that he's done. Um, sort of his interpretation of an American flag that sort of represents or is representative of the Afro African American community in the United States. There's a lot of history behind it. A lot of stuff, of course, you can Google and find out. And I really like the overall, you know, I really like the overall color scheme on it. I think it works really well, right? You've got the black and red uh, vertical stripes. And of course, you've got the stars here at the back. And you've also got the addition, which I thought was cool of three or oh no, two or well, three laces right you got the blacks here and the other two laces that come with it so i, would, I thought that was quite cool that you could essentially change the entire look of the shoe by via you know the addition of a couple of different laces they're a bit loud you can probably pair them up with a pretty basic outfit and sort of keep it going or you know get all petty umo on it and just kind of color combo it all the way to the hills now I'm not the biggest Converse All-Star guy, right? Because my feet are too wide at the front, I guess, right? I've got a bit of a fat toe, so it's quite difficult to wear these. And I've always been a bit of a big believer, not big believer, but it's always been my um, opinion that usually you're either a Converse dude or you're a Vans dude. There's no real guy that wears both i've not really met for the most part because usually if you wear vans your feet usually tend to be on a bigger side or you just like that aesthetic more so you know the converse aesthetic and of course i think the one star especially this sort of like i'm saying this is going to be the 70s it must be the 70s right because i think what they've done really well i think it is the 70s but i think what they've done really well converse is that they've essentially redone or kind of retooled the old models right with a similar sort of shape and kind of giving it this really nice shape that isn't as flimsy as you would kind of get from the other ones like in store i think i'm gonna say i'm not sure if this is a 70s it might just be a regular model but regardless i like the colorway um model i'm not too keen on not too sure if it kind of fits what i wear but again you know it's christmas so i thought i kind of spice up stuff stuff i'll buy you know i'll use everything i've got here black right black on black on black so it's nice to have a bit of color included in there and um yeah man i'm not too sure i'm not too sure if i'm 100 percent sold on these if if i'm gonna end up wearing them in the end but i don't know man there is something about them that i quite like you know and the fact that i got them on sale as well was pretty beneficial too um but as a shoe there's something that i quite like about them and i don't know if it's gonna work out for the stuff that I wear, but let's see, let's bloody see. But let me know your thoughts. What did you, or let me know your thoughts on my, I don't I don't care what you think about my shoes, so don't let me know your thoughts because you're gonna hurt my feelings if you tell me, but let me know what you got yourself for Christmas. Did someone get anything for you or do you just um, do like most people and just pretend it never happened? Let me know in the comments down below. But yeah. <sighs> okay, let's move on. What else do we have here? what else do we have here oh we have this funny hilarious humorous video online so of course most of you are familiar with my um most of you are aware of my infatuation with all things public freak out right i love a good um supermarket argument i love a good shopping mall argument you know gas station um fast food restaurant 
drive through all that good stuff right i flipping love it and i think there's something to be said for people getting into more of these confrontations during covid um i guess people are just bored they don't have much to do they're sort of spinning their wheel at home talking to the same two or three five people that live in their household and they want to just spice things up a little bit so what better way than to go to a regular you know um shop that's been open for the entire time during the pandemic to serve your needs and harass uh retail workers who are earning a modest wage trying to keep a roof over their heads like everybody else right what better way to do that what better way to show that you're an absolute gentleman or an absolute queen princess of a person than to go to a shop and disturb people who you know by all intents and purposes shouldn't be working in this first place because you know they're putting themselves at risk but they're doing so in order to make sure you have your um oreos and whatever other stuff that you shove down your throat when you're at home contemplating whether or not you should jump out of a window this is one example and probably my favorite example um so far of the week because it asks it, uh, it just makes me ask so many questions as to what's going on who these people are um why do they think this approach makes sense and generally um the sort of person who'd want to do something like this like who are they where, where do they live and how can I avoid not being around them in any way, shape or form? So let's play what they're doing here. Hey, hey. So in case you're listening, there's a video here of a, of a very bulbousy looking young lady. I'm going to give her a bit of a blight here and say she's young, but she doesn't look that young. Um, essentially trying to crash her trolley um into a young gentleman in a supermarket because he's wearing a mask it looks like right there's some sort of anti-mask debate thing which they have in the states we don't really have to have a lot of them here in the uk we've had a couple here and there but i don't think they get as same amount of um viral success as they do in the us i think the us seems to have a penchant or a real liking for car crash television and there's nothing more car crash than seeing a very bulbous young lady trying to smash her trolley into the abdomen of a young dude as he kind of effortlessly just holds it back a bit and kind of you know instead of running away sort of steps back a couple of times and she's really struggling to keep up with him it's an absolutely incredible exchange and she's shaped so weird too if you look at the video it's like nothing in her body makes sense like for some reason her ass is super big but then the thighs aren't big then she's got really skinny legs a really bulbousy chunky middle section it's a really confusing um, um sort of body structure and whatever it may be and i guess it's maybe um a representative of just how um how would you say ugly her soul is right that she'd go into a shop and harass people shopping and you know minding her own business because she wants to further or she wants to kind of um signal boost her argument that wearing a mask is somehow a sign of um what it's a sign that the <laughs> the government have it in for you and 5g towers are taking over wherever it may be there's something about that right it's very rare you see these public rare public freak out people and they have their shit together they you know they're well kept um they're not loud they have a haircut you would want they wear cool clothes it's very very unlikely it's always kind of these odd sort of like freaks of nature people who you would never see normally in your day-to-day -day who just saw sort of kind of seem to they all seem to find each other as well that's a very interesting part of it everyone that's kind of in her group looks like they should be in her group right um from the person recording it to everybody else around it, it's just odd very very odd let's continue watching it And look how excited everyone is. Everyone's got, a, I think they call it in your mum's house, they call it a dad boner. This is like the equivalent of like a board boner, right? There's like, I don't know, 10 people or so in the shop anyway, just shopping, you know, doing their thing. And then of course, there's the people that are surrounding it that are kind of trying to capture the footage in order to share it with their social media, with people on their social media feeds. And it's like, God damn it, man. Like, how bored you have to be that you think like there's obviously been times when you've been in a supermarket or sometimes i've been in a shop where you've seen people having an argument and you sort of like maybe turn around to kind of catch a glimpse as to what all the trouble and the commotion is about soon you quite re you realize quite soon okay it's some crazy person just keep on doing your thing and go home but you don't sit there 
Well, I know I don't. You don't stand there with your phone on a flipping tripod, right? Live streaming it to your audience of 22 people on your Instagram live, hoping that they see this crazy stuff too. Isn't that crazy, really? Just a couple of or well, a couple of loonies, which is kind of a describing someone crazy, deciding to get into an all-out argument because one person decides to put a surgical mask on their face and the other one decides to wear, um, sp you know, run faster uh, Oakley glasses. I don't know. Get the hell out of here. Call the cops. You just got a woman. This guy is now snitching on on some oh the guy gets a guy behind the camera snitching. There's a random security guard trying to buy his lunch. He doesn't want to get involved. There's a weird looking black dude with white rim glasses trying to buy what a couple of protein shakes, uh, a, part, a couple of energy drinks probably or something like that. It's just an absolute shambles. This guy hit a woman. You hit a woman. <laughs> yeah, I love him. He just he sees what's going on. He's like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> You? You Jesus hit her. You Christ. Hit her. You hit her. You hit her. And the thing is, all that lady has arguing the most, she can just about walk. She looks fairly young. Don't get me wrong. She just doesn't look like she's 24. She's maybe in her 40s at most, maybe 50s. And she looks like she can barely walk. But she's got on these weird skinny jeans that don't really complement her shape too tough. But she's really struggling even to attack the guy. Like, what happens to somebody that they get into that poor, that they're in such poor conditioning or such poor health that they can't even hit somebody at the magazine stand of a supermarket till somewhere? How does that happen? We have it on video. We hit her. We have it on video. Look at her. It's pussy like the um, it's pussy like the N word for white people in the US. A lot of women, or sometimes people that want to, you know, get a reaction out of somebody, tend to say that word to kind of you know get them going. Is that a big deal in America? I don't know. Let me know. If someone calls you a pussy, do you suddenly turn into the Hulk and want to smash their head into a wall regardless of their gender? Well, probably don't let me know in the comments because they don't want anyone attacking you. But yeah. <laughs> And look at how weirdly she's shaped like i just can't get over it it's just such an interesting person she looks like she can't walk properly i wonder what that is now she's coughing on him absolute dorks Look at her face, the guy in the in the in the in the American football jersey nodding away, like just the absolute dregs of society, isn't it? Like, God almighty. And I think I've I think I came to the conclusion the other day that a lot of this sort of like um maybe it's oh, I forgot what I was watching. Maybe it might be Michael Myers talking about it. Like, you know, um about the need for succession, right? where you know a certain group of people decide to kind of pull away from regular democracy because they don't agree with it in any way shape or form or leadership right and sort of kind of i guess come, come together and sort of found their own state or whatever it may be called right sort of you know going down the whole anarchy route and it made a lot of sense because you look at some of the debate that goes around the people that are like mask are mask wearers and non-mask wearers there's never going to come a time in, there's never going to be a time in life, right? <laughs> Where you're ever going to convince either of, you know, either person that the other person's right, right? Or the other side's right. Or convince her to go on the other side. You're never going to convince a non-mask wearer to wear a mask. You're never going to convince a mask wearer that not wearing a mask is, is okay. Um, they just operate on, they're just living in different worlds, right? They're kind of absorbing different information. They've got different worldviews. It just is what it is. So it's probably for the best that you just sort of like live their lives that way. This idea that you should go into a supermarket and try to kind of what evangelize pe by, with people by trying to ram a shopping trolley um, into their abdomen and, you know, hurling abuse at them and kind of concocting this weird story that they're abusing you and they're not. It doesn't really work. I don't think so. Maybe it's just me. Another person recording. How many live streams are there? There's, no, there's a black guy again. <laughs> now she's screaming, telling people that crying foul play that he insulted her. And she's 
and she's too fat and lazy to even flop on the floor. That's what the funny thing is. She's obviously trying to get the guy in trouble, but she's so fat and lazy that she can't even bring herself to flop on the floor to kind of get a bit of a reaction and sort of like, you know, stir up some controversy that way. She's just standing there screaming, he's hitting me. It's like, God almighty, man. God almighty. Where, like, yeah, it's, it's disturbing, but it's probably not surprising. And it is what it is. We live where we are. Um, <laughs> and until the world, and maybe it's just a consequence of people just being at home too long, isn't it? during covid this is just like a natural um con natural con yeah a normal con a, no a normal consequence of locking people indoors for a prolonged period of time with no insight in in in, you know, in mind that they're gonna kind of freak out and do these sort of weird things to their fellow citizens going through just amounts of trouble because it's different i guess it'll, it'll be somewhat different if she decided to go to like a really bougie sort of supermarket all right uh, upper class place and berate people over there and sort of like say hey you're not living our reality that we're living you sort of like you know get on your whole like um you know um five percent is rant whatever it may be that might have a lot more weight to it there might be something you know attached to it but i'd imagine a lot of the people that shop in these stores are probably in the same tax bracket they probably earn about the same amount they probably have the same sort of you know economic dysfunction family dysfunction um that they just have to kind of go through societal dysfunction problems with the police and the authorities whatever they have loads of the same things right in common the only things that separates them is what the color of their skin maybe their religious beliefs but apart from that they're probably the same people so it's very odd that you'd go to these places and berate people who are go through the exact same thing that you're going through just because they haven't got a little bit of cloth over their mouth over their faces it's like huh i don't know maybe it's just me maybe it's just me now something very funny um as you guys are aware i'm a big fan of the la comedy scene or the yeah the la comedy scene podcast um, of course i've got a few favorites and one of them is your mum's house with uh, christina p and tom segura um it's a little bit of an acquired taste the podcast itself right they do kind of spend most of their time trying to gross each other out they're a husband and wife duo and um, they're either trying to gross each other out or they're trying to make um the people the guys in the production team um giggle in the background and it's always a bit of fun um it's probably not the best thing to watch before you eat <laughs> or before you go to sleep i've got to be honest but it's uh, hilarious and one of the segments that i love the most is um this weird sort of bit they have going on where basically christina p is convinced that her husband tom segura is a closeted serial killer right because he seems to um revel um or delight in the pain and the suffering of others especially when they're suffering you know a very serious especially when they're when they're on the end of a very serious injury or accident of some of some kind right and there's this kind of famous one of i think this asian dude look who yai look like look who die look who yai is sort of like in a garage somewhere fixing a car and i guess the dude who's in the gar who's in the car parking the car into the garage accidentally takes his hand off the brake or whatever it may be and he rams the um the asian mechanic dude into the wall and sort of pins him back with the car sort of ramming into his legs and he's screaming oh, God, yeah. in his asian accent and you know of course tom would cry i think the first time i saw it, i cried with laughter too right first a bit of shock obviously because i've got to pretend like i'm you know like i'm woke but for the most part i was laughing my ass off as well so there's loads of those type of videos there's a really cool one that i saw the cool, cool guy club but it's a cool girl club um where this um rather large lady decides to take a running jump off the side of a cliff somewhere heading into some ocean into some water and she just about clears the you know the sort of the edge bit where she should have, she would have basically broken a few bones her body which she probably ended up breaking because she landed she didn't land the best in the war or two there's been a few right obviously fed smokers a flipping legend um loads of people on there but um tom segura himself i guess maybe this is maybe a cosmic retribution uh karmic retribution in some regards he got himself into a bit of an accident because he decided to um film a segment or to do some funny comp i don't know what it was even filmed for there was something going on with, between tom and burt kreischer where they decided to you know partake in these very sore sports i think they did tennis and a few other things and you know they've got this idea that they're very sport they're very kind of active people even though they're both incredibly overweight um probably 
uh, Bert more so than Tom, and they had this genius idea that they would make sense for them to go and play basketball. <laughs> and um, it ended very poorly for Tom Tigoro, so much so he broke the entire left hand side of his body. And now he's, um, from what I've heard so far, he's now addicted to antidepressants. <laughs> no, I'm joking, but no, it wasn't a fun. It wasn't a fun accident. Um, again, karmic retribution. I'm not too sure, but this is the video of Tom basically explaining his injury, and it's flipping brutal, 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 brutal. Um, let's play a bit of it now. Come on, go. And he goes, "You're gonna have to dig deep on this one." He goes, "You're gonna have to reach for that inner Larry Johnson." <laughs> And I felt an adrenaline rush. I should have almost like calmed down before I, I tried. I've heard lifters talk about it too. You know, if they go like, you get too hyped for a big lift, they're like, you can get too, too hyped up. So I remember being hyped up. <laughs> and I was like, I'm just gonna jump and see what happens. <laughs> Oh my God! Right, if you're not if you're not watching this, um, if you're listening to this and not watching the video, Tom Tugoy decides to again. I don't play basketball. I'm from the UK. We play football, but for the most part, I guess he's trying to lay up or trying to do that thing where you sort of like you throw the basketball in the air and you sort of like let it sort of fall into the hoop instead of kind of you know um, whatever that move is called. And as he's doing it again, I've never seen someone fall over this way. This is maybe another example of. Um, a real clear indication of when somebody is athletic or not by via how they run right i'm a big stickler for people's running form because i guess because i run a lot myself but you can quickly tell when somebody doesn't play sports by the way they run and i guess maybe just tom's run up alone right towards the net um should have told us everything we need to know about how successful this would go and of course his smile here is classic but look <laughs> Just a running, because I've never actually seen anybody. Like, I don't know how he was able to fall backwards from that position. Because essentially, if you're listening to this podcast, he's heading up to the hoop, running up to the hoop, right? And the idea is to sort of jump and, you know, as high as you can with the ball in your hand and then release in the hope that it kind of fall into the hoop. You'd imagine the, the thing that you'd probably end up doing is maybe fall into your side or fall into your face because you're obviously reaching up that way. You don't think you're ever going to fall backwards, right? Because the, the hoop is in front of you. Maybe if the hoop was behind you and you were trying to run backwards or something and then throw it in, that would make more sense. But I don't even know how he ends up in that position. Then, of course, when he ends up in that position, the key is to brace, right? Or to kind of allow yourself to fall on your hip, to fall on your bum, maybe your back, maybe your side, but there's a way that you fall when you're used to playing sports a lot that will prevent you from having an injury such as this. Because when I saw the picture, I didn't actually even get how his arm ended up in this whip because he ends up in this weird, if you ever watch Family Guy, whenever the, whenever the main guy in Family Guy falls over, I think the illustrators did a really good job to illustrate his, and, you know, he's really fucked up his body by always getting his arm to be like in the opposite direction of where it should be. And somehow that's what Tom's arm ends up, right? His form ends up in some weird position. <laughs> and it doesn't make any sense. But it's just such an epic example of like um, why some people should probably concentrate on making sure you lose weight. Because I think this is probably most of the reason why he got injured, right? His body just couldn't, his knees and his legs couldn't support what he was trying to do. Um, especially with the weight that he's carrying up above. And it just gave way. And it's also funny as well as a fan of the podcast and a fan of Sober October and Joe Rogan, all these kind of people, to think that Joe Rogan will take so much pride out of crushing these guys when, you know, Ari is what, in some Central American country doing yoga and taking copious amounts of drugs. Bert Kreisch is, you know, permanently drunk and his face is swollen from all the beers that he drinks every single day and box wine he drinks when he's running on a treadmill or running. And then Tom Segura spends most of his time driving supercars, right? Like, <laughs> and telling dick jokes and fucking around on TikTok of his wife on a podcast. He has no business, no business trying to run up to a hoop and play basketball in any capacity. Now imagine he makes, he injures himself like this with no one around, right? He's not playing two on two, three on three, whatever. He's just essentially trying to illustrate a skill or display his range of basketball skills, whatever it may be. And this is where he ends up. Okay. Okay. 
And I have to be honest, at the time when you know Christina was acting really melodramatic and the whole production team, I was a bit like, hey, this is ridiculous, right? He just fell over and it happens in sports, relax. But having seen the fall and knowing that he's a dad and a comic and a middle-aged man, this is not fun. This doesn't seem like the most <laughs> amazing, especially considering they were trying to film a bit of a bit to put online and it kind of ends up like this <laughs> i can imagine it's probably the worst time he's probably had in a while especially the end of the year right they've had a pretty decent year i think your mum's house right they probably made a way they probably made a way through during this dark time you know they've done a few live shows uh you know the studios all nice and set up um they've they've figured things out right in a very you know uh, i guess um sketchy time during their individual comedy careers a stand-up career sorry so to end the year like this is just oof, brutal. His arm. His arm. No, I've never seen anyone go for a dunk and that that happened. That really kind of freaked me out. Yeah. <laughs> I swear to God, I swear to God, man. I've never, like, again, I don't play basketball. I'm from the UK. We play football. But I swear on my mother's life, if you would have told me, if you would have showed me the injury and then, told, and then tried to get me to figure out how that happened, I would have never guessed it was him just trying to go for a layup or whatever it's called. I would have never guessed it. I would have just assumed it was, I don't know, um, you know, when you sometimes, you know, when you're playing basketball, someone maybe pushes you to on the, onto the wall and maybe you fell backwards and sort of fell over that way or, I don't know, any other, new, every, any other numerous ways you could have done it. But I would have never assumed it would have been an uncontested layup that he decided that he kind of fell over and ended up breaking half of his body. I just, I knew something was wrong immediately. It's, it's so fast though. Ah, and just going back and then landing <laughs> and just being like, oh, fuck. Because this trumps this immediately. We all just have to this, uh, but let's get our max on. Yeah. Put you back here on your spine. Do you have any pain? No. <laughs> Put anywhere down your back. No, I remember that the paramedic kept saying, why are you playing with these kids, man? <laughs> like, you old fuck. This is this. These are the people that Joe Rogan kind of brags about beating in sober October, right? Dudes that can't play basketball for an hour or two without getting put in the back of an ambulance. Like, oh my god! Hi guys, thanks for all the uh, well wishes. Um, I broke my arm and snapped my uh, patella tendon. And um, I'm having both repaired. It was uh, during a uh, slam dunk competition, which is totally reasonable for a 41 year old. Oh, during my. Do you see the x ray? Did you see the x ray? A uh, slam dunk competition. Oh, my God. He legitimately. Because usually you see people. You see people. Um, break you see people break something and it's usually like a crack a fracture or a split but you never see like the bone just like away from the other bone that's what essentially he has in his arm oh my god that is so wild that is so gnarly that's just again another illustration of just poor physical conditioning right um i think he was bragging before about doing powerlifting, but you know I don't think the powerlifting continued for that long because those bones are brittle as fuck, innit? One little fall like that and they completely snapped. Which is totally reasonable for a 41 year old. God almighty. Uh, 238 pound male adult to do. Who now he's having to relearn how to walk. He's probably on a whole host of prescription drugs. Plays a lot of And I'm guessing, you know, with two young kids at home and Christina P, she's probably loving this. Isn't it? Basketball 20 years ago. I don't think, it, I, I'm not freaked out to play basketball again. I would definitely be like, I'm good if somebody was like, do you want to do a dunk on this nine foot hoop? I'd be like, mm -mm, nah, I'm good. All right. Wow. Wow. 
And again, somehow Burt Crasher gets away scot free. How does that happen? Can someone explain how Burt Crasher, probably the most unhealthiest of all of all comedians, ends up not having any injury, getting away completely scot free from the situation once again? It must be that Mickey Mantle gene, and it? it must be that Mickey Mantle gene. But again, man, um, I don't know. Get well soon to Tom Segura, I guess. Um, what a freak of an injury. Again, I was one of the doubters thinking, oh, they're moaning about nothing. It's not that big of a deal. He just fell over playing basketball. But that looked like a brutal, 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 brutal injury. Um, <laughs> something that you don't wish on your worst enemy. But Jesus Christ, man. Jesus Christ. God damn it. Um, I heard the the New Year's Eve podcast suffered somewhat as well because of his, um, you know, he's just going through it, I guess. And if you're, you're, you're kind of, he's immobile. He's probably not able to do a lot of things himself. He needs a lot of assistance. He's probably on a whole host of meds. That's probably, uh, you know, not helping with his mood. And um, from what I saw on the sub, everyone was saying, you know, Tom wasn't in the best mood when it was on the New Year's Eve live stream that he put together. How he even turned up for that, I don't know. He probably should be spending all of his time trying to get better and trying to recover as best as he could but you know i guess when you sell tickets you kind of feel obliged to honor the fans and do what you can to keep them happy but god almighty man that fall was brutal uh brutal fall funny to see though again considering how much time he spends laughing at others pain it is the nature of the game it goes around comes around i guess in in some regards what goes around comes around <sighs> next on the list we have funny and interesting news number two DJ Academics has decided to declare war, 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 war. Nobody is safe on Rory from the Joe Biden podcast. And um, I'm all for it, man. I don't know. Again, it's really stupid. It's really dumb. It makes no sense. Um, No one really wins from this. And um, if anything, it's maybe a further illustration, not further illustration. It's maybe a reminder to people. If you just don't rate somebody, you probably should spend as little time as you can possible talking about them, insinuating that you don't rate them, um, downplaying their name, kind of, you know, saying shitty things about them in passing. Because the moment they decide to react, the moment they decide to retaliate, you're not going to like the results of it. And especially in the hip hop community, right? DJ Kadaris has always had a little bit of a problem um, with how he's been perceived, especially post, I think... Yeah, my theory is that whenever, when as soon as DJ Dickner obviously, you know, strategically decided to jump on Complex and do the everyday struggle alongside Joe Biden, right, during the epic nine months run. And a lot of the reason why he did it was because he wanted to be more famous. That's my opinion, right? He wanted to kind of be a more of a personality in front of the camera and not just a guy that sort of speaks, um, um, sort of, and it's or sort of kind of speak, does a voiceover for his videos on his YouTube channel or even maybe a post, you know, um, snarky comments um or captions on his ig post he went to be more of the voice of the younger generation speak to the lils and the whatever it may be called um and that's obviously it worked for him in the long run but i also think as soon as he did that he was also exposed to the industry which he wasn't really exposed to prior maybe he got communication with labels posting stuff up and whatever it may be but he never had any experience dealing with the many individuals that are involved in the music industry right the corniness the fronting the posturing um, and of course the artists as well so as soon as he got into that fray he quickly realized that however he thinks of himself or whatever his fans think of him the industry thing is completely opposite especially the industry that would like to pretend they're the cooler kid in school, cooler kid in class, right? The big bad bully type people. They sort of look at him like the dork. They sort of look at him like the, you know, nuisance, um, somebody that's exploitive, exploitative, de uh, destructive, bad influence, blah, 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 whatever you want to label to, towards him, right? I, if anything, I still think he's a symptom of the industry at large. I don't really think he's, a, um, he's at fault for anything. He just, you know, essentially is a reflection on what the industry is and you know no one likes to look at their ugly reflections so i guess that's why people react to him negatively but over a prolonged period of time because again because i've been a fan of the joe Biden podcast for a while but it has been a sustained thing whenever academics name would get mentioned especially during joe's time of everyday struggle there would always be a kind of um collective sunning and dismissing of academics and his platform which is okay at that time because i think you know they don't they're never going to be friends they're never going to appeal to the same people um some of the uh, most of the artists i'm assuming the academics you know sort of uh, profiles on his platform um marl and rory would never listen to so 
so I I got the kind of you know I got the kind of an adversarial nature of their relationship but as time went on you did kind of get the feeling a lot of it was like why are you wasting your time or Dr. Mojo why are you wasting your time talking to this bozo and when it gets to that level especially in hip-hop with people's egos you obviously kind of leave yourself open to the person retaliating in ways that you probably might not deem to be the most morally correct and this is where we ended up in a situation we are now at the moment right they took constant jabs at him um he obviously replied in some extent i think they took a lot of pleasure in didas and mirror shitting on him he obviously didn't react well to that started crying on stream um obviously the amigo situation made him look more like a pussy to in their eyes so there was always this kind of unbalanced sort of um attacker act and then i don't know what happened what why this changed suddenly i could just switched completely and just kept putting the pressure on morori or mo right just really being really disrespectful and stream saying the most craziest things about these guys and it's really odd because joe budden's obviously good friends with academics still friends i mean in industry sense which always rub me up the wrong way i never really understood that i think if i was mo or rory i would really be angry upset that Joe maintains some level of friendship with academics when he's so openly disrespectful to those guys in public and says all manner of really mad shit about them and their position on every on Joe Bunda podcast and how they get paid and insinuating that they're basically workers and all the, like just stuff that is really disrespectful that you would imagine be disrespectful regardless of who it's coming from even someone you don't rate you don't just let someone talk to you anyway any way shape or form so you'd imagine Joe Budden being their friend he would maybe side with his friends more who he says are he's close friends and he couldn't do the podcast with anybody else apart from those guys but he doesn't he went on live stream with academics a few times in between the insults or during the insults um when they were bigging up the everyday struggle team when they ended um he made a point to kind of shout out Ak, and they were obviously like now nah, don't shout him out only nessa and so nessa only nadeska and somebody else right they all went out of their way to kind of make sure no we don't rock with that dude you do and he's still maintaining friendship with him which is odd but you know this is joe Biden. he's a strange guy but i think if the shoe was on the other foot i think joe Biden would be a little bit upset if those guys remain friends with people somebody he clearly had an open beef with so it, it continues and now we're in a position where in a recent podcast um on a recent live stream on twitch academics went on a mad rant like 47 minutes long i'm not gonna play the whole thing but it's like a little two minute clip here someone loaded up and it on youtube where he essentially insinuates that he is kind of privy to some information that push that kind of uh alludes to the fact that um he might know he has information that that he yeah he has some information supposedly that alleges that rory has cheated in the past or is cheating with um um with his fiance and yeah he's sort of basically threatening him threatening him with releasing that information and kind of holding it out over his head and basically goating him and baiting him that if he replies in any way shape or form he's going to just launch a flurry of insults and revelations on his head top in in the hope of kind of essentially ruining his uh up and coming or potential marriage and if you watch the end of year podcast rewards thing that they did at the end of the year for the Joe podcast what they mentioned something about weddings and parks was like talking quite positive about his and then you know a bit of dead air and then rory said let's just move on so there's obviously some issues there with rory at home which i know i think as fans that we've basically seen he's kind of been going through it these last couple of months like probably all of us have and you know the reasons why he's been going through it are varied and kind of deep and who really knows his business that regard but the fact that i could go stoop this low is obviously disappointing but we shouldn't be surprised right he's kind of shown us who he is over the years um and a part of me still thinks that rory and moore have uh, are only people to blame for this they've constantly taken jabs at the guy he's clearly somebody that doesn't necessarily abide by any sort of code or um whatever it may be right he doesn't have one of those things so he's definitely going to do whatever he needs to do in order to make sure that he doesn't look the chump in it because he's just fed up of being kind of looked at as an idiot or being taken as a fool right he sort of stood up to meek mill pretty bravely i thought of course over the internet not in person still different because he saw you kind of seen how he reacts on, in real life when the whole migo situation had happened right and you're sort of twitching with a microphone but you can chalk that up to just first um sort of first confrontation jitters but it's, i don't know what's happened with Ak. he's just 
something switched in him. He just like, I'm not taking any more disrespect. And he decided to kind of air out Rory's business. And this is a little clip where he's kind of insinuating the fact that he kind of has information regarding um, Rory's um, <laughs> potential uh, marriage that he's going to unleash to the world and in the hopes of wrecking it. You call my bluff. Finish him. I, fin yo, I finish him in the most exquisite fashion. You know me. Ak is a gladiator. I live for the people. When a nigga challenges me, I say, people, is it this or this? And whatever they say, I'm with it. That's the difference between me and you. I made my life for this whole entertainment shit. You a bum trying to live some fake-ass existence and an ad-lib of the joke. I'm only sparing your ass because I'm a man. Hmm. But you did show it to my crib, which which violates all type of codes. And oh yes, so that's a bit in it, right? So I, I guess in within the arc, within this sort of back and forth along the way, somehow it was alluded or it was kind of insinuated that um, Rory got a hold of academics' address. I think he tweeted or tweeted out the zip code, and then he decided to go around and drop a card in his post box or something, and those kind of things. <laughs> You know, these sort of weird power plays and Ak didn't take too kindly to it the fact that number one he knew where he lived and number two that he would kind of threaten him in this sort of passive aggressive way and he's just not having it man he really isn't having it bury him I'm like you should bury this fucking nigga man bury him bury this nigga man but perhaps and by the way chat Remember I said this. Ripple effects will happen. I don't got to say shit. Ripple effects will happen. You know why? I've been waiting for y'all to make it to the altar. Sign the paperwork. <laughs> anyway. Big Suge Knight energy, isn't it? Lols. Yo, Grand Wizard. Don't say a word. Grand Wizard. Grand Wizard. Grand Wizard, my lieutenant. Grand Wizard, my lieutenant. Grand. Grand Wizard, spam in the chat. Yo, nobody type but Grand. Nobody type but Grand. Grand, did I not send you the proof? I said, I said, Grand, I can't believe it. It's, it's at least two months, and I told him, don't tell nobody. Hopefully, he didn't tell nobody. Grand, I fuck with you for that. But. It's 2021, man. We got to get this shit back later. <laughs> Yo. I ain't shit. Yo. Grand Sword in 4K, nigga. I know it was cute when nigga said I bought a G-Wagon. I ain't buy shit. Rui, what'd you buy? And there's some sort of insinuations about Birkin bag, but you get you get the gist of the situation. And um, what do I think is going to happen next? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's see. Rory's in a lose lose situation. If he beats up academics, no one cares. If he doesn't answer, he's a pussy. Um, he essentially played himself in the situation. He got himself involved with somebody who has no real uh, I don't say ethics, moral, whatever it may be called. Right? He doesn't have that thing. Right? Because. It, part of the issue that i have with this isn't that they have they have beef people don't like each other they can argue they can have their beef they can fight it's the tactics he's using if you want to draw somebody out you just draw them out you don't need to draw them out um uh, using their girlfriend or using their fiance i think that's some real sucker shit right that's obviously it's not even bro code that's just like what are you doing if you want to draw me out and you want to actually scrap you want to settle this once and for all there's a ways you can go about doing it it doesn't have to involve my lady my family it doesn't need to go that way at all um and kind of drawing this out into this weird sort of dramatic reveal i know your dirty secrets game it's just like what are we doing like what are we doing um if it's a tip for tap thing because if it's a tip for tap thing i'm sure where you can get a hold of information that the academics wouldn't want there to be public because you know in terms of bozo moves i'm pretty sure academics probably done a lot more bozo clownish type stuff in his life that he's been embarrassed about they wouldn't want people to know i again i assume who knows maybe he's told these chap guys that 
I'd assume a lot of the stuff he's done that he's kind of wants to keep under the wraps he wouldn't want them to know so he could they could go for tit for tat and then who wins there no one really wins if anything both people end up looking the corniest obviously in Axe's eyes it's probably another W in his belt because he's taken a lot of L's publicly right he's been sunned by a lot of people and he's standing up to the likes of Rory on a very popular podcast somebody that he's sort of friends with who's very influential in the industry and Maul of course who has his Jay-Z and Rock Nation connections so they're people that you probably you know if you were sort of like media trained and worried about your industry links you wouldn't want to beef with but the fact that he's standing up to them shows that he's sort of willing to sacrifice whatever industry connection he has to make sure that his pride is intact which is you know commendable even though it's a bit questionable the way he's going about it um and then of course you know the mick mill thing in it like it's another real big indication that he's just not I, again i'd love to know what happened something happened with act where he just decided enough is enough no more sunning of me in public um and i like the energy i'm gonna be honest i don't like the approach i don't like how he's going about it but i like the energy i like the fact that he's like nah enough's enough i'm not being bullied anymore um i'm not going to be blamed for the ills of hip-hop i'm not going to be blamed for people shooing each other people overdosing on drugs people not selling enough records whatever it may be right that people sort of pin on him you're sort of like nah enough i'm just a mirror of what you guys get up to and if you don't like it stop doing stupid shit which is you know i fairly kind of agree with but of course he does insert himself a little bit too much in some bits and pieces the whole six nine thing was really disgusting i think to watch from the outside in considering the amount of people's lives that that guy ruined with his snitching forget the what forget what you think about his crimes just what he did with the actual act of snitching and how it ruined people's lives was really bad and the fact that he came out being unremorseful a bit it's just rubbed people out the wrong way so i think him inserting himself in that situation was odd the war and shire act stuff you know of course his karmic um consequences of that will come when they come if it doesn't it doesn't but again that's not something i can really comment on not, not, don't know too much about it but i'm interested to see how this ends up man i'm really interested to see how it ends up because i'm a big i just don't think there's only going to be any winners here like i said if you're rory and you beat academics up so what if you're act and you end up beating up rory so what like i don't think anyone wins i really don't like yeah it'll be a bit of a w on someone's capping for the short term but long term will anyone care probably not everyone just moves on no one wins this argument um no one wins this debate no one wins this beef if anything again it just exposes or shows up joe budden for being um a bit of a shitty friend i think if this was him in roy's position he would never be happy with the guy sort of like jokingly being friends with the other dude that he saw beef with openly you know um you saw and then again like you have to give Rory credit I think Rory was the one who walked out of that Drink Champs episode when they started talking spicy about Bob about Budden right about Joe Budden and he sort of like stood up for his friend and said hey I can't be in a room if you guys are gonna speak ill about my friend and he left again it was a bit of a dramatic thing maybe a bit of show but he still showed how honorable he is as a, as a friend and I think Joe Budden hasn't done that it's felt like so far in public even right maybe he's done it behind the scenes and he's told both people to chill out and they're not listening to him who knows we don't know but but so far from what I've seen, he's been a little bit too happy to just kind of laugh at the drama as it's going on. And now look at the situation that they're in. The academics is threatening to ruin uh, Rory's marriage. And Rory seems like he's on a real bad streak of emotions and he might act out and do something he might regret. No one's going to win here. But let me know your thoughts down below. Who do you think wins in that battle? Next on the list, what do we have here? um oh this is one yeah interesting so um question how many people that listen to my podcast are joe rogan fans i'd love to know i think there's a few right because i'm a big joe rogan fan of course who isn't a big joe rogan fan you see how i do my thumbnails um for my clips on the show you see how i do my you know captions for the show as well you know i'm a joe rogan fan um if anything i got into podcasting via joe and via tim ferris possibly more so via tim ferris because of the first kind of book that i read i sort of opened my mind up to having sort of designing my own lifestyle and not sort of um going via the going down the conventional route of employment and education was reading the four hour work week and then via the four hour work week i stumbled upon the blog and in the blog and then stumbled upon the podcast and all that industry and then joe rogan blah 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 so that's my kind of gateway and i've always been a big fan of him you know he's obviously kind of you know interviews very um interesting people from you know a huge swath of uh 
disciplines and backgrounds and it's always kind of really engaging conversations maybe the last few years the quality of the guests has sort of dipped somewhat but again i think in general for providing free entertainment and content sometimes five six podcasts per week most of them are you know two hours plus you know you can't really compete with joe but with joe rogan sorry when it comes to that regard and of course his you know ability to sort of introduce me to mma because i don't think i'd get in, i'd be a fan of mma or jujitsu or martial arts in general um apart from movies and stuff if it wasn't for joe rogan too so that's kind of credit to him as well and um you know just a kind of idea of sort of you know pushing yourself and uh trying to become a better you as much as you can the sober october stuff has really been helpful along the years as well like loads of good shit but maybe it's just me, but I've have felt like the last few weeks or so, or last few months, my kind of, uh, or last year, last month or so, or I've kind of stopped listening to the show in full because I'm, I'm a big, I used to, prior to the switch from to Spotify, I used to watch most of the videos, watch most of the podcasts on YouTube, if it's a, someone I really want to kind of see, but then most of the time I'd listen to an entire thing on Apple Podcasts, right, via audio, but I'd get like an indication of the what the show is about via the clips, and then kind of, you know, go and listen to the whole thing, but I did most of the time listen to the whole entire podcast, so like if I shared that every week, regardless of who was on the show, but I felt as if, whenever as soon as the podcast switched over to spotify permanently and they sort of you know put all the shows on the spotify app and you have to kind of play them via there and it doesn't come up anymore on my youtube and you kind of get this couple of clips that kind of direct you back to spotify my kind of daily or weekly um uh usage or listening you know of the show has really dwindled over the over the last few weeks and i don't know man i think in i think obviously short term it's been amazing for joe you know to get that spotify check have that money hit your account must be amazing i can only pick, i can only imagine what that must feel like you know after all these years of grafting and doing a thing on your own and then you know because he earns a, i'm pretty sure he earns a pretty decent amount doing it by himself with sponsors and whatever maybe an adsense and whatever and sponsorships then to then get a platform um like spotify to decide to you know pump to give you a hundred million m's um a hundred million dollars you know or more just to license your podcast for a set period of time um on their platform must be amazing right and then have that check kind of clear in your account like god damn it right just incredible 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 and he's you know does a really good job of kind of keeping himself super level-headed he has a few money for generations and doesn't really act like it which is great and you do get a far better podcast i think because he's not really tethered to um sponsors or to you know corporate overlords so you do even though you don't like what he says sometimes in some regards you know he's downplaying of covid has been a bit annoying over the time and you know constantly going on and on and on about lockdowns in california and you know how comedians are the most intelligent people in the world can get a bit cumbersome but for the most part you still do get the i feel like the raw opinions of this sort of like a middle-aged man who's essentially a master an amount of wealth that allows him to be a little bit more free of what he says and a bit more open and you know um to be less risk averse i'd say but over the last few weeks i've kind of stopped listening to the show and it has to do with spotify it definitely does and again i wonder if a lot of other fans are like that as well you've kind of just stopped listening um I can, there might be a clip or two i stumble upon that i might watch but in terms of keeping up to date with who the guests are i don't really know anymore I, the last show that i watched in full was the mark norman episode that was pretty funny because i'm a big fan of mark norman too but i've kind of found myself a little bit you know pushing back from it and this is a clip um called curb your podcast where somebody sort of like um highlights uh the same issue that i'm having now at the moment with spotify oh no the issue with ads i think because some people have been complaining that if you watch listen to the entire episode on Spotify, i haven't actually had this problem but he includes i think he kind of bragged about or boasted about the that he has too many ads for spots right he's kind of blessed in a position he doesn't need to put every song that ad on there because he hasn't got the room and he doesn't like mid-rolls right you know as a sort of like happen and jump in in the middle of your show well it seems like you know since he's signed to spotify a lot of things have changed right the shows that were meant to be uploaded onto another channel have never got uploaded the alex jones thing never happened the mail episodes they've disappeared they've gone um that was all a bit of a lie and a ruse and now this idea that he wasn't going to include mid-rolls ever has changed too because now spotify are purposely sort of injecting them in there now the theory is from my side, I would imagine, 
I think, you know, when you get paid a hundred million to license your podcast on another platform, you probably stop giving shits about what they do because as long as they don't get involved in booking his guest and sort of fucking around with the template or the structure of the show, he doesn't really care, right? He just does what he needs to do in terms of Joe Rogan. I'd imagine because he has that made, he has let that be known sometimes, but there are some people that believe that he is agreeing to allowing Spotify to include these mid roles uh, in his show. And it's sort of annoying a lot of people. So let's play the little clip here. It's called Curb Your Podcast. Hopefully it doesn't, I don't get taken off of YouTube for it. Because, you know, Ben Pixels are notorious for their <laughs> cooperative nature when it comes to playing clips. Let's play. Do, 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 do. Good relationship with them. But talking about Spotify. I don't need them. No. If they went away, I have too many ads. And that sounds gross to say, but it is a fact. I yeah. have many more ads than I have spots for ads. So if they went away, it would not hurt me at all financially because I put a limit on how many ads I do per podcast. I also don't ever interrupt a podcast with an ad. I don't do that. Right. And because I don't do that, that costs me money. But I, I just feel like the experience of listening to a podcast unbroken is so much better than listening to a podcast. We'll be right back with this word from DraftKings is here to help you make it rain. <laughs> DraftKings is America's leading. Download the DraftKings Daily Fantasy app now and use code ROGAN. Enter code ROGAN to get a free shot at millions of dollars in prizes with your first deposit. That's code ROGAN. Only at DraftKings. Make it rain. You know, it just it's, it feels gross. I have too many ads. I have too many ads. So, what do you think of that, Joe Rogan fans? Are you not surprised that he has sort of changed tact somewhat and decided to allow mid roles, um, you know, during his time at Spotify? Or do you, like me, think it's mostly a Spotify decision to just insert them in there because they paid for the licensing fee and they're going to do whatever they need to do to make sure that they get their money's worth um, with having Joe Rogan on the Spotify platform? Let me know what your opinion is in the comments down B. Low, 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 low. Okay, so what do we have here? Oh, oh, okay, this is funny. So, of course, I'm a. I I would I would think a lot of people here are familiar with my, or are well aware of my interest and love for dance music, specifically techno, and you would know that you know going through a global pandemic one part of my life has been completely put on pause which is my ability to dj which i was doing prior you know most weekends every weekend i think for the most part in local bars and pubs in my um local area that i live in and then of course being a fan of dance music i was a bit of a techno tourist which allowed me to go to various places across europe uh, kind of frankfurt barcelona madrid paris um, loads of other places to basically go and see some of the best teachers in the world playing some of the best clubs in the world and um, it was a big part of my life I think a lot of people can attest to this right um, when you're when you're a clubber when you're a fan of dance music when you're a fan of electronic music um, going to the clubs and going to see your favorite DJ play or going to just you know um, socialize with your little community your little um, subculture you know for lack of a better term is part and parcel of being into something right you don't just i don't think a lot of people would just listen to the music and just keep it like that you want to go to at least a couple of shows right whatever it may be right and you know maybe a, a couple of yearly pilgrimages to places like Berkheim will be included but for the most part just your local scene is good enough right you want to see local acts you want to see international acts come over brilliant 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 but of course with covid that's been completely kind of you know off the table for the best part of a year or so um a regular event anyway we've had obviously some sort of covid safe type of events popping up here and there in berlin they had this weird sort of like open air thing going on you know they've kind of have a bit of a culture out there with open air parties which are essentially just raves and parties that are happening in beer gardens um they have those so set up in most places so most venues are able to kind of um utilize their spaces in that way um, of course berlin summers are beautiful so you can kind of get away with it a bit more but some of the ethics around it were a bit dicey especially when you consider the fact that <clears throat> a lot of the governments weren't necessarily um taking as, as as serious an approach with covid as they probably should have in the summer to kind of stem the flow which is why we're all basically in some version of a lockdown in most parts of like you know western europe for the most part of it but 
people sort of kind of let that be because you're outside, you know, whatever it may be, you know, um, suppose the virus doesn't spread too easily outdoors. You've got a face covering on, blah, 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 blah. But it's been a while since I've been to a rave, right? The last rave purpose, the last actual rave I went to in London was maybe seeing Gerd Janssen at XOYO in Europe. Obviously, I went to see, I went to Bergheim to see, um, Nazir and a few other people play and uh sound stream a few other people. I think it might have been in February. But that's the last actual party I've been to. And then obviously since then people have been throwing loads of illegal raves here and there. Um and it's been a bit of an issue. It's obviously been a bit of an issue because of the whole playgrave situation, which essentially stemmed from a hashtag online. I guess maybe uh made popular by business techno people or business techno group of people on that kind of anonymous platform where they're sort of highlighting very i would say people that you would deem to be affluent djs deciding to play in these far-flung places around the world um inevitably you know prolonging the spread of covid and the amount of time we're spending on the lockdown and inevitably when they left their location where they're playing at the numbers you know continue to spike which again whether or not you can attribute it directly to this person playing in that location who knows but in terms of optics and in terms of um global compliance it probably wasn't the best option or best way to go about things whatever and it kind of stopped it felt like towards the summer the playground thing stopped a lot of the reason why it stopped in my opinion is i think that um, instagram removed the ability for you to search geotag search instagram stories which is the way a lot of people got a hold of the clips and the videos from people attending these play graves a lot of people wouldn't upload a video or clip of them at a party on their main instagram feed so they'll probably upload it onto the instagram stories and then geotag location or geo yeah, geotag yeah or geolocation tag their post so if you wanted to check whatever if somebody was uh, flipping i don't know else club in berlin right or uh cause here in london you just search for it and then go through the instagram stories instagram go through the instagram stories but somehow i don't know why they decided to remove it but supposedly i heard it's because of the election i'm not too sure but uh, for some reason they decided to remove that feature from instagram so that sort of i felt like stemmed the flow of footage so a lot of djs could kind of get away with it and of course being publicly shamed let a lot of people sort of hiding the fact that they were playing in places and sort of pretending they weren't playing places just not posting them online but there seems to be a really weird perverse need for a dj to share where they're playing which i don't really understand and it's inevitably leading to a lot of beef online with a lot of people right people are getting really upset that djs are basically playing in these mad locations uh during a global pandemic and um a recent event happened actually for new year's eve two events one i guess one illegal one semi-legal the first legal event was in ukraine they had like a special new year's day uh ray from the first of jan up to the next year to basically the 2nd of january and they enlisted the support and the help of a whole bevy of berlin based djs some ukrainian based djs and maybe a couple of uk peeps but for the most part most of the people that I see on that lineup were based in berlin and stuff and one of the people that basically got called out for some of his kind of um somewhat tone deaf responses was somebody that who i rate a lot right um techno producer and dj blauan and he essentially got on his instagram stories and decided to complain about his um i guess flights leaving ukraine and coming back to berlin or back to wherever he lives so this is a post here for business test note it says the following this is a screenshot from blau on instagram profile of him taking a picture of an airline and then writing the following on top he says i've been illegally refused to travel because a lot of airways believe cause of covid i cannot transit in poland your staff were rude i bought a new ticket you saw my uk passport you took my money then immediately refused to give me a boarding pass because of brexit quote unquote he says disgusting i have a legal right to travel freely in europe Europe um until june 2 2021 clearly you tra under train your staff and of course he added a lot lot airlines and fly a lot as well on there so kind of doing what most djs do in their general everyday life outside of covid complain about airlines right um it's sort of a bit of a humble flex but i guess going through a global pandemic it comes across very tone deaf you know very, you're not kind of um reading the room too good and of course the fact that you're playing anyway during a global pandemic is just probably not the smartest thing to be posting on your instagram stories um and then on the next screen 
we have an image that looks like somebody reached out to him, somebody called FMT1, and basically replied to his story and basically said the following, playing a gig during a pandemic while thousands of people die and then cry that you can't fly home is pathetic, which it generally is. And then, you know, Blauen decided to do the most mature thing, which was, you know, put an emoji of a middle finger on there, got to the person to fuck herself and said that they know nothing. And in the next screen here, we have um, to the people sending messages that I'm disgraced and disgusting for playing a show just so I don't have to give you the venom back. I will not apologize. I'm not sorry. The party was absolute fucking fire. You know nothing of my circumstances, so keep it to yourself. And um, I guess that is somewhat true. I think we don't know his circumstances, right? He could be on his last tenor euro whatever it may be and he you know doesn't receive any benefits from the government or no grants whatever it may be he's supporting a family and he just has to do what he has to do to kind of make sure the lights are on he's you know food on his table roof over his head whatever it may be cool um i think most people are mature enough to understand that people are having to do what they need to do to support themselves in a way in any way that they can during this pandemic especially um considering the um, lackluster um, approach some governments have taken to dealing with COVID and you know uh, supporting people in creative industries and people that work in hospitality people that work in you know in a freelance capacity it's just been difficult right to kind of make sure that you're keeping your head above water so if somebody presents you an opportunity to make some money even during a global pandemic which you know you probably shouldn't do I can understand the uh, um desire to probably do it or you know wanting to do it regardless right even if you have the money again because I, I, I think pocket watching people is weird i just think there is an element of like civic duty there is an element of like um i won't say was it morals even ethics whatever it may be where you would hope that part of the reason why you got into this obviously was to make money make a living but part of the reason was for you to kind of you know, dance and celebrate with your global community of fans of the electronic and dance music scene, right? Um, and not having the ability to see or connect with all your fans, right, at a set time in an actual legit nightclub with people coming and all that sort of stuff isn't necessarily what you want anyway, right? It's sort of like my thinking behind, like, when everyone was doing these sort of, like, weird um, gigs at rest no, restaurants, but these sort of, like, what we had in the UK, we had basically, I think they had it in the cause where you could basically book a table in sort of like your own little section. You sort of made sure everyone there was COVID secure and keeping their distance, blah, 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 blah. And then you just were not able to stand and dance and the DJ played in the corner. And again, it's not the best experience, not really what I would call a rave or it's not conducive at all to anything that I'm interested in whatsoever. But you got the appeal. You understood the need for fans to go and, you know, socialize with their friends and for DJs to play music right because that's what they've known for the best part of 10 plus years right so it makes complete sense but even that was a little bit I thought counterproductive to the idea of us kind of understanding the severity of the issue that we're in because I think that's what basically happens is that I'm not a fan of lockdowns I don't think they work I think they only work in the beginning of a pandemic right in terms of actually stem the tide of people going to hospitals but then there is something to be said for limiting the amount of, I guess, leisure activities people get up to. So people understand the severity of the issue, take it seriously, lock in place for a short period of time so that we can open up and don't have to close back down again. Because I think that opening and closing has essentially led to the position that we're in now where people are fatigued, whether it's the artists and the customers and the clients are willing to put themselves at risk, go to these events and play. DJs are willing to fly across the country fly across you know europe to go and play somewhere like ukraine um just so they can make sure that they pay next next month's rent because you know landlords aren't pausing their rent because of a global pandemic um you know bills need to get paid because you know they're not gonna give you um any sort of grace in that period maybe a month or so but we're now what close to 10 months into um living under some sort of restrictions with the with covid19 so again i understand it I just think it would be beneficial if a lot of these guys just didn't post anything online. Again, like I said, this event happened in Ukraine on the 2nd of January, as you can see here from the screen. Um, a whole host of DJs played. Again, the, I don't know how you pronounce the name of this club in Ukraine, but it's really well known. Um, and look at the people that played here, right? Uh, Deal, Blauan, Crombie, Freddie K, right? Somebody who you'd probably expect a bit better from, right? Uh, Gail, Nastya Vogan, uh, Recede. Rennie Wise, Sally C, Sedef Ad, uh, Adasi, um, 
Titter and VTSS, right? Loads of people that you're full familiar with, especially from Berlin, um, especially just from the scene in general. And none of them got involved in any sort of public scandal because they just kept it stum, did their gig, got paid their money and kept it moving. But Blau and went to kind of, you know, um, jump out the window, complain about a connecting flight and try to lecture an airline about a uh, Brexit procedure and essentially got himself in a whole heap of trouble online. Again, it's not that big of a deal, but it just paints a bad picture, I think, for the scene overall. I think we're all sort of suffering, right? We're all sort of bemoaning the fact that we aren't able to go and celebrate and do the things that we want to do outside um, in the dance music scene in any way capacity. And um, we all would love to do that in some regards, but we kind of have to, I guess, um, pause on it a little bit and wait for things to open up and get a bit safe before we can do that again. And it's odd as well, because I think, I can't think of any other industry in the entertainment uh, or in the arts that's so that's as entitled as people in the dance music scene, which is odd, isn't it? Because you always think it's a little bit more egalitarian, hippie, all about people. I don't know what it is, but why is it that DJs think that they have the, I won't say the right, but they have, they just, they should be playing at, in, at all cost when I guess your local band that you know and love that plays in your local pub around the corner probably haven't played in front of a proper audience for probably close to a year right legitimately because they can't just go and play like a random covid or plague um concert it doesn't exist but play graves are a big thing i wonder what it is about djs again maybe it's you know it's the ease of maneuver uh maneuverability right you can basically you know as long as you've got a pair of headphones and a usb you can play literally everywhere um and i'm guessing if you're in a less developed country like the places in south america everyone's going to play at the moment you can maybe get yourself a bit of a bargain and get someone really big and popular to play in your country that would never play because they don't have any other gigs and they're desperate for the money and desperate of playing time but it's just i find it very odd i just that's the only thing i find bizarre like why is it that djs are the ones that are hell bent on making sure that they play when people in bands haven't played for time, like why is that a thing? Um, and why is that also acceptable? Why do people sometimes think that's okay? Again, uh, depending on the country you're in, you know, the support system might not be there. There's no grants. There's no way for you to kind of earn a living outside of actually going to play someone, which again is a bit of an issue. Um, but again, in the beginning, it was all the affluent people playing. Now it's kind of people do you feel like need the money again. I'm not speaking in people's pockets. I don't know what everyone's finances is. They get a feeling these people need the money to kind of keep their head above water. So there's less of a stick on them, but less, less, less hazard a guess. If this list didn't include everyone that people sort of like in a scene, people have a lot of love for, right? Of course, minus Blauan because he's kind of, um, you know, made a bit of a tit of himself. But if this included people like Nina Kravitz, Charlotte DeWitt, Amelie Lenz, Bless Madonna, Peggy Goo, what would people be saying online? They'd be having a lot of shit to say about them. So I think people need to keep the, the same energy. I don't think you should be going to raves anyway. During a global pandemic, you should be keeping yourself as safe as you can, making sure you stop the spread of COVID wherever you may live so we can all get back to raving in some sort of um, regular scheduled time frame, right? The last thing that I want to be doing is dancing on a table somewhere, tapping my feet. I want to be in an actual dark, dingy underground basement bar or club, wherever it may be, rocking out to somebody playing in a corner, um, redlining the flipping sound system. That's what I would like. But we all have to kind of be in this together. We kind of all have to, you know, um, do away with the need to sort of party regardless of what we may do on our own regard and kind of get around the idea of like, hey, if we kind of chip in and make sure that we sort of keep in place and be as safe as we can for now, that we could all kind of go back to raving very, very soon. But again, shout out to Blauan for being a bit of a weapon. <laughs> shout out to you, mate. You kind of fucked yourself there, didn't you, mate? You fucked yourself. Everyone else played, didn't get any stick. But you decided to complain about connecting flight and now you got people on Twitter trying to cancel you and shit. Uh, oh, some of these guys are like, I wonder sometimes like, maybe it's the, just the time spent in the DJ booth just listening to stuff so loud, right? Um, playing some of the best clubs, you know, on gear every time, every weekend, just surrounded by absolute, you know, slurpees. It kind of maybe detaches you from real life. You don't necessarily have an idea how to conduct yourself in a normal world. Because some of these things that these guys do, you're like, why would you be so dumb to post stuff like that? Just keep it to yourself. Keep it moving. Like, God almighty. 
But again, what do I know? What else do we have here? I'll quickly go on. Uh, oh, we have an update here from um yeah i guess we have an update yeah i guess we have an update courtesy of page six from alexander wang considering uh concerning the allegations of sexual assault from a few models um over the last what week or so um one model obviously came out um that owen mooney kid right owen mooney yeah owen mooney and then a couple of people from the scene who attached kind of regurgitate their story that i have heard over the last few years and it, again so somebody has been familiar with the industry familiar with people in and around it i've heard these rumors for a while heard these allegations but you just kind of you know chalked them up to just being accusations and nothing else so to kind of get to a position we're in now where people are sort of you know the momentum is building and people are adding more fuel to the fire it's, it's a bit odd just a bit feels a bit strange um but again it, i guess it's a uh, it's if ever there's a time to be held accountable it will be now especially if people have time on their hands and they're bored and they're willing to sh on the board time on their hands willing to share their stories and they probably feel a bit safe um things have kind of moved on um since you know what four or five years ago when the original allegations i heard sort of uh, you know kind of around the industry and um yeah people just had enough it feels like and i guess alexander wang's had enough too because he uh replied to the allegations in a very odd way first of all two sets of um replies here from him so this is from page six design alexander wang designed sexual assault try to get this thing off here for i know um, it says fashion design fashion darling alexander wang is facing a mount accusations of sexual assault which he adamantly denies instagram account um sha shhit model management internet watchdog di prada um in recent they shared several anonymous stories of alleged misconduct, including one person's claim that the designer served water lace with party drug Molly after model Owen Mooney came forward earlier this month. Mooney, who says he met Wang during a chance encounter in New York clubbing, two thousand seventeen, claimed the tick claim via TikTok the designer groped him. So um his this is wang's reply right here's what he said um when asked for comment wang denied the accusation in a statement to page six and said the following over the last few years or sorry over the last few days i've been on the receiving end of baseless grotesquely false accusations these claims have been wrongfully amplified by social media accounts infamous for posting defamatory material from undisclosed and or anonymous sources with zero evidence or fact checking whatsoever seeing these lies about me being perpetuated as truth has been in infuriating right so a very strong response and something that i think i spoke about um previously about the interesting ways some uh, abusers and alleged you know alleged abusers decide to kind of address and approach really serious accusations and from what i've read online so far uh, the only two ways to deal with it is to ignore it and hope it goes away which it doesn't and the other way is to come out swinging like he has and completely discredit your accuser so paint the platform out to be disingenuous fake news question their um ethics and morality blah -de blah 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 in the hope that you just kind of muddy the signal and then you can kind of move on that way um kind of the the, the trump approach it continues it says i've i've never engaged in atrocious behavior described and would never conduct myself in a manner that has been allied, alleged i intend to get to the bottom of this and hold accountable whoever is responsible for originating these claims uh, vi uh, viscerally spreading them online <clears throat> so he categorically is basically calling anyone that's accusing him of such you know disgusting acts has been um, detailed in my previous video as being a liar which is a very interesting approach to take and from what i've seen so far it doesn't usually work um so it was no surprise that the reaction when, when that first came out was like oh this is definitely words of an abuser he's guilty as fuck he's guilty as fuck and it's no surprise that he then decided to put out another statement on his own um instagram page again turning off the comments which is an interesting approach is definitely a sign of guilt or a sign of trying to avoid any kind of pushback or comment on your story um because the original post itself on diet prada is you know hundreds and hundreds of comments and stories regarding um alleged abuse and stories concerning alexander wang but he decided to post this other statement on his own instagram profile that says the following it says 
I'd like to take the opportunity to connect directly with the people who have followed and supported this brand and me over the years and address the recent false fabricated and most anonymously accusations against me. These based accusations were started on a social media sites which repeatedly dis disregard the value and importance of evidence or fact checking. Now, that's an important point to make because what Alexander Wang is doing is kind of establishing doubt on the platform because if you're familiar, Diet Prada is basically the platform synonymous with calling out copycat and um you know frauds and you know the, uh, let's say questionable people in fashion but some of the allegations or some of the kind of reporting done on there has been a bit surface level they haven't really necessarily done their due diligence and there's been a lot of favoritism right there's been a lot of calling out of certain people but not calling out of other people but it's interesting to see somebody like an alexander wang who's very much liked in the industry and behind the scenes kind of people have a lot of good things to say about him even though he's probably a um and a, a sort of a closeted raging alcoholic but people have a lot of good things to say about him which is funny because diet prada is also a platform that a lot of fashion insiders sort of like boast about being familiar with and knowing right it's sort of like a platform that people sort of love but then in the last few years or the last few months especially in light of the george floyd incident in the u.s unfortunate and of course the subsequent protests they've now become a little bit of a um black sheep in the industry right people kind of are taking every opportunity possible to sort of point out that they're no ally to any sort of uh, group um, marginalized group within fashion which has been very interesting so it's interesting to see Alexander Wang using that same approach to discredit them and obviously kind of lend credence to it no I'm not an abuser come on it's coming from Diet Prada you know they chat shit you know they're not about the culture you know they're about tearing you know they're you know they're about tearing marginalized people down and bloody blah 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 you know how it is right and upholding you know uh, fashion industry standards and norms whatever it may be it continues my team is doing everything in its power to investigate these claims and i promise to remain honest and transparent throughout this process so it's a lot more human right it's less of the kind of confrontational combative approach to the prior statement it says i'm fortunate to have received an overwhelming amount of support over the last few days and i'm thankful for those standing by my side this time but no one's come out publicly which is another cool indication of just how fickle the industry is i don't know wang who knows if he's a creep and if he's a um, abuser behind the scenes from what i've heard the stories do seem like they're true who knows they're they're alleged at this point in time because he hasn't been tried in a court of law whatever it may be but what i also know about the guy is that he throws hell of a party he throws crazy parties he always puts people on list um he's very kind of open with you know sending people stuff for shoes so people love him so it's interesting that the ones that actually believe that he's innocent are unwilling to come out publicly and defend him because they don't want to be seen as co-signing a potential abuser but they're also willing to behind the scenes privately support him in the hopes that he continues sending them close and putting them to contact with people and you know in you know making sure that they do and their sons get intern jobs that's the slimy backhanded um snaky nature of the fashion industry again he could be you know r kelly reincarnated we have no idea but it's just funny that this person who's been good to so many people behind the scenes in his real moment of need when his entire fashion empire could come crumbling down because i don't think he's going to survive this personally regardless of whether or not he's able to prove the stories are incorrect i think the smut and the smudge that's been put on his name is completely you know it's unwashable um, those allegations are too varied and too far flung for this to just kind of be a thing you just move on from and i just think the way he's so sort of dealt with it and approached it is basically been a bit shocking and again he probably won't survive this in in theory going forward but how interesting is it that none of his big fashion friends in the industry who love to kind of boast and post pictures about themselves in the front row, take pictures of him in his long straight hair, smiling, pulling faces, jumping his comments, are saying anything now. None of them. They're all stum, they're all quiet. Why? Because they were probably aware of the things that he was doing behind the scenes. They turn a blind eye because it served their purpose and serves their need at that moment in time. It's a disgusting, shocking game. It is what it is. Um, again, I'd love to see what happens going forward. I, again, my theory is, my uh, guess is that he won't survive this. I think, you know, more more likely than not, 
the allegations will probably get swept under the well, swept under the rug. He'd probably deal with them privately behind the scenes, settle out of court, have it maybe pay damages, da 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 da, address them again one more time and try and attempt to move on and then probably turn himself into a recluse designer. That will still affect their overall sales. No one will want to be associated with him, you know, but doing collaborations and having certain people walk on your show. It's going to be very difficult or it's, I think a lot of fans are going to hold a lot of people accountable if they do stand next to him and go out of their way to do so you saw what happened with terry richardson and the allegations against him were you know even uh they had uh they were they were kind of decades decades long allegations and a lot of papers a lot of sorry a lot of editors a lot of magazines took a lot of stick supporting him throughout the years and you know if you according to the rumors he's still working sort of you know as a ghost behind the scenes still doing stuff so that is obviously a bit questionable about the industry but it's just funny man it's just funny to see like it, it, it must suck to be Alexander Wang right now to see the amount of people that have just like stopped ringing you your phones are pinging off as much the group chats are not really you know what I mean it just must be so lonely and again another indication of just how fickle the industry is mate one moment he's everyone's friend the next moment because a story comes out that may be true or maybe not who knows everyone's now you know publicly distancing themselves and probably privately too i think their whole line about people are supporting me thank you support is probably bullshit that's my opinion but again let me know your thoughts down below what do you think via that development anyway that's the casino show episode number 417 thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's your first time checking out the show via youtube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe leave a comment down below if you listen via the podcast app of course leave me a five star review and share it with your friends it would be my pleasure if you did so but until then see you very soon take care be safe peace